coming up on you? Yes. Hi, this is Paula Glory, and this show is called Farther Down the Rabbit Hole. Today I am joined by Scott Goldberg, who is a documentary film producer, and he is working on a film now called Dying for Change. Not only a younger person, but a dynamic younger person who is already uh, learning how to contribute. Sure. Not a problem. Thank you for having me. Great. Uh, what I want to do right now is read to you a couple paragraphs from a letter written by a man who is a nuclear physicist. He got his Ph.D. from Cambridge, and then he worked most of his time in the patent office. Although not specifically mentioned in my latest and probably last book, Creation, the Physical Truth, I have formed the opinion, crazy as it may seem, that the solution to the world's energy problems is documented record dating from 1871, when U.S. patent number 119825 was granted to Daniel McFarland Cook of Mansfield, Ohio. I refer to this in lecture number 27 on my website, aspden.org, ASPDEN org, Papers Bib 2002 AHTM, and believe that underlying physics con connects with what Tesla and others were researching. By setting up a radical pulsating electrical field between concentric cylindrical electrodes or their equivalent in solenoid form, energy is imported steadily from the quantum underworld. In my research, I was looking more at what could be a magnetic equivalent to this process, concluding that any success would result in cumbersome technology compared with the simple high-voltage capacitor structures implied by the Tesla More and McFarland Lane proposal of documented records. My contribution is to show how the same physics explains the creation of Sun and Earth, accounting for the speed at which they begin to rotate the energy feeding that rotation being supplied by the quantum activity of the ether in which we are all immersed. Given what our future offers as we confront the world's developing energy problems, it will surely be an ironical outcome if eventually the world comes to realize that the simple solution to the world's energy plight is of documented record in a U.S. patent dating from 1871. What is particularly ironic is that investors in such technology might have difficulty protecting their interests by future patenting given that record of an 1871 patent. But as someone who was engaged in the patent profession for many years, I can say that brain power will somehow cope with such Hello? issues. Hello? Hello? Hi. Is this John breeding? Um, I can say that brain power will somehow cope with such issues, though it will need a little more than normal brain power to face up to the challenge of undertaking research of an energy source seated in what we see as empty space, the mere vacuum. Um, so, Scott, what, I've, what I'm hoping to talk to the psychiatrist about, John Breeding. Well, let's say hello. Hi, is this John Breeding? Hello? I'm hoping that you can hear me. I cannot hear you, but... I can hear you. Great. I can hear you, too. Welcome to our show. Okay, good. Great. I want to say uh, that while we were waiting uh, to connect with you, I read a couple of paragraphs from a Ph.D. in physics in England who got his degree from Cambridge and then went on. Most of his career was spent in a patent office, so he's able to take theoretical knowledge and make it practical. And his conclusion, you weren't able to hear, was that even though the patent was made, uh, was done in 1871, indicating we could get energy from the vacuum, this might be a stumper to people who are looking only for money, and they won't invest in something unless they can secure and own the patents. But he's ending, because he's a good scientist, saying that he's convinced that brain power will find a way. So I'm joined by Scott Goldberg here, who is a producer of a film called Dying for Change, talking about the innovative changes that are being made, particularly among the young people, to have a better society. So before I turn it over to you uh, and your expertise, the theme of this show will be, how can we unfold our full potential and brain power, and does financial interest affect 
what a doctor is able to contribute to society by making the society healthy and avoiding mental illness. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, and, and I want to say I met you on YouTube, so thank you Good. for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I, I was just particularly concerned how you were talking about mental illness, and it, would you like to speak about your position? Sure, yeah. Uh, well, one of my favorite teachers about, uh, I think, Rochester, uh, Thomas Zotz, he wrote a book in 1961 that made ways in the psychiatric kingdom. It's called uh, The Myth of Mental Illness. When you have a conversation about mental illness, you know, it kind of assumes that there's this thing called mental illness that we're talking about and that you and I and everybody who's listening in the conversation all, all knows what we're talking about. When we say mental illness, like if we were talking about a rock and everybody knows what a rock is. And uh, my experience though is there's actually a lot of confusion and, uh, uh, and that mental illness is really kind of an unfortunate concept. What Zotz was talking about was that the, the concept of mental illness was created as a metaphor for physical illness. So like you have cancer or you have diabetes or leukemia or whatever and similarly you have a mental illness like a schizophrenia or depression or attention deficit disorder or something you know. But the, but the point is that, that mental illness is a metaphor for that physical illness, that it's really not the same, that, that the mind does not get ill in the sense that the body gets ill, you know, that, it, that, that there's a physical or chemical abnormality that constitutes this physical illness, but that mental illness is just a concept that's used to put on somebody's judgments about somebody's behavior. And so really we've just got this subjective thing of somebody who's acting in a way that we're judging as quote unquote abnormal and we're calling them mentally ill and so it's a real problem you know because it has tremendous implications in that we say somebody's mentally ill and in today's modern doctor system psychiatric system that means we're saying that they have some sort of biological or genetic defect and then we want to give them the drugs presumably to treat or control that but without any evidence that they have any biological or genetic defect and so it's a huge social uh, kind of dynamic and we have to clarify the language in order to be able to see reality at all. You know, so, so for example, we've got millions and millions of school-aged children in this country on powerful, heavy-duty, mind and body controlling psychi psychotropic drugs for these alleged mental illnesses like attention deficit disorder and, and bipolar disorder and all that. And they're all taking these heavy duty drugs like methylphenidate and methamphetamine, you know, and, and, really? uh, and uh, Prozac. And, Prozac? And, um, wow. And so Zyprex children are put on, I thought Prozac was for depression. It is, but that's one of the mental illnesses, you know, depression. And so that's so have, sad that children uh, are depressed. A lot, a lot of people, including a lot of kids that get given Prozac for for ADHD, it's usually so-called ADHD. It's usually for it's usually uh, more than methylphenidate, the Ritalin or the speed type drugs, you know. But they're all for these for these supposed mental illnesses, which is really just our judgments about those people people's behavior. So none of those children that are being given these drugs are really ill, but they're right. called mentally ill, but they're not really sick. They just they're just not behaving the way somebody thinks they ought to behave. I was, uh, when I was seven years old, I was put on Ritalin because, you know, they said I had ADHD. Um, when I was 18 years old, I had broken my arm in school. I, uh, I was in very much into basketball, and I had uh, fallen onto the floor and broken my arm, you know, two of the bones in, in my arm. And so my parents and I decided, hey, you know what, maybe let's, you know, let's try to heal a little bit more, you know, uh, healthier. Let's try to get out the Ritalin. A couple of years later, when I was like 22, I went to a psychiatrist who, you know, helped me through my teen years. As you know, many teens have problems and, and things. And he wanted me to get back on the Ritalin. And I said, you know, I really don't feel like I, I feel much better. I don't, I don't feel, you know, my body doesn't feel sluggish. And I think the thing was that a lot of these doctors, when they go to medical school, they're, they, they, they learn how to treat the, uh, the symptom. 
but not the cause of the symptom. I think that's, I think what, that's a big, what, big issue. What was your symptom that the doctor, the psychiatrist at 22 or 20 would want to put no, you back well, on? Well, ever since I was seven years old, because I was not, he was the one who prescribed the Ritalin when I was young. Uh -huh. So um, when I didn't want to take it anymore, he's like, you know, I really... He took you mean, it personally? Yeah, you, you know, you really should get back on it. We really should put a prescription for you. And I, that's, that was, that was can, a little... Can you speak to that, yeah. Dr. Breeding? I was, yeah. Well, sure, yeah. You have a, a seven-year-old, in this case, Scott, you know, and, and uh, who somebody is judging that his behavior is not appropriate in whatever sense, and so therefore he supposedly has this mental illness, you know, which is called attention deficit disorder, you know, is a, a mental illness, you know. But I guarantee you, and, and Scott, you can confirm this, you know, I don't think, I'm pretty darn sure because I've never run into a case different, you know, that that nobody gave you any kind of laboratory test, nobody identified any kind of physical or chemical abnormality. Correct. You know, there was no blood test, there was no uh, analysis of the chemicals in your brain, there was no physical or chemical abnormality. Sure. It was strictly based on somebody's opinions about your behavior that that diagnosis was made, isn't that right? Exactly, correct. Yeah, correct. and so then the doctor assumes that that's because you have some sort of genetic defect and, and that's basically what these doctors do. They, they, they're, they're conditioned into this belief system that problems in living are due to biological or genetic defects called mental illnesses, and that the appropriate treatment then is a drug. That's basically, nowadays, 99% of what psychiatry has to offer is these various heavy-duty psychotropic drugs, and then the backup treatment when those don't work very well is electroshock. Oh and so that's gosh. what they do. So when you go back to that doctor, that's really all he has to offer. Of course. And so he says, you know, and the other thing is that once you have this mental illness, since it's a biological or genetic defect, you can't really heal from it. You can't recover it from it. So if you've got it, then you've got it. So if you had it at 7, then you must still have it at 22. And so you need to go back on your medicine. So sure. really it's not medicine, it's just a drug. I know. So it's a kind of a mind control that the doctors are subjected to. I'm sure the doctor was well-meaning and he really believed what he was saying. Is that correct? Well, I don't know that doctor and, and so I can't say. That's an assumption, you know, and, that, and that's what a, a decent person would like to believe. And I think it's sometimes true, but I think it's also true a lot of times they're, they're pretty cynical and thoughtless people, so I, I can't really? speak for that particular doctor, you know. but. But oh, he if he that. was sincere, you know, what he, d what he does know is this. If he's trained as a scientist, he knows that there's no lab test, there's no objective test, there's no real indicator of disease. And so he's operating from a belief system, and all he has to offer is drugs. And so whether it's out of good intentions or not, the end result is you take a child who's neurologically normal by all indicators at that point, there's no, there's no physical indicator that Scott had any kind of abnormality at age seven until the point that he started taking the speed. And that point, he's neurologically abnormal. And so it's kind of ironic. So whether it's good intentions or not, it's still administering a substance which is damaging to virtually every organ system in the body. Really? And it's still telling the child that there's something wrong with you, that you're defective, and that you need a drug in order to cope with your life. Sure. What do you think of that? Does that make sense to your experience? It definitely makes sense. And, and a big thing I've been studying as well, maybe you can and talk about it, is, is raw foods. Um, there has been um, this place in Florida called Hippocrates Institute. I don't know if you've uh, known about it or researched it, but um, it seems that a lot of people who have cancer nowadays are getting chemotherapy. Um, a lot of people who have cancer have been going to these places where they put you on a, a juice fast, more on a raw food diet made of vegetables, fruits, nuts and seeds, um, you know, green drinks, and people have actually reversed cancer right. from this. But people do not, <laughs> the, the news media doesn't want to cover it because, you know, of, of the money that these doctors make. I think and that's a drug as well. I think chemotherapy kills the body. You know, right. along with some of the cancer. But you're you're not dealing with things like cancer, are you, Doctor Breeding? Well, you know, there there's a, there's a place right outside of Austin, Texas, where I am, called the Optimal Health Institute, which is real similar to what Scott's describing, and and it's Wigmore, a, it's a, I think it's a juice fasting and and, yep. and wheatgrass implants and all that stuff, a, a detoxification and purification program, and that can be very very helpful. Uh, the, 
again, though, the key in terms of this conversation is is to really separate out that people tend to think uh, since psychiatry is officially a branch of medicine, you know, and, and since psychiatrists are medical doctors, you know, we the, we got to use medicine. The, the idea, yeah, and the idea is, that's presented. In the, to the public and in the media and the propaganda and everything is that mental illness is like physical illness. And so, but the big difference is that cancer is, is to use the example Scott gave, is 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 uh, is, 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 discuss, is validated or verified by the identification of an abnormality called a called a malignancy. You know, called a you do a biopsy. What you know? is it? But depression or ADHD or bipolar or whatever is just a checklist of behaviors. Sure. Are and you a it's, a, it's, 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 that's the fundamental thing to understand, you know, that, you know, and if, and if, and if it, is, and sometimes behavior can be caused by a physical problem, like if you have real massive blood sugar imbalances, you might experience depression, but it's not because you have a mental illness, it's because your blood sugar is out of whack. That's a physical problem which may benefit from physical medical treatment. Dr. Breeding, what you just described is a nutritional approach. Can you talk about your training and how you got to where you are today, wherever that is, and explain that? Well, I'm a psychologist. I'm not a medical doctor, first I see. of all. Okay. And, uh, 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 so I went through training to become a psychologist. I've been a psychologist for over 25 years. You know, I work with... Uh, all kinds of people in all kinds of situations, and uh, I just happen to have really taken on this thing of, of our current mental health system and psychiatric system because it really affects me. You know, I had to figure out, since I'm a so-called mental health professional, I had to figure out the same question that a lot of people have to figure out nowadays, you know, that if, you, if you're, how do you, how do you remain ethical if, if, you're, if you're working in a profession that's largely unethical? So this is definitely true. You know, one of your professions, obviously, is media, right. and journalism here. Right. And so, you know, yeah. the, the reality is that the me, the media, the profession of media, is is largely unethical in today's world. It's mostly owned by corporate interests that provide a certain propaganda line that supports those corporate interests. Right. You know, and so how do you do? journalism or media and be ethical and so you're finding creative ways to do it right same thing as a mental health professional you know how do i stay in that profession if it's a profession that's drugging our nation's children into oblivion that's telling people that they have biological and genetic defects and they need drugs to cope with their life that's electroshocking hundreds of thousands of people and damaging their brains that's involuntarily committing called forced incarceration called locking people up against their will who have not committed a crime, called 1.5 million Americans every year, you know, <laughs> who somebody says you're mentally ill and so you lose all your civil rights and we can lock you up, you know. Or these take are your some patents the, away. <laughs> or these take are some your... of the ethics out points of my profession. So I had to figure out, and so in order to do that, one thing that I've done is basically, and this is kind of how you found me, is taken on this belief system and try to explain it to the public, you know, so that parents will quit going along with the doctor's recommendations to drug their seven-year-old kid. But or family members will quit going along with the doctor's recommendation to have their mother or their grandmother electroshocked or stuff like that. What about your parents? Were they open to saying no to the doctor? I think uh, ever, ever since that happened where I had that injury, um, they kind of wanted to stop it anyway. I'm not, uh -huh. I can't really speak for them. I'm not really sure, but... Right. Um, I think, you know, maybe, maybe you know, since I was 18 years old at the time when it had happened, maybe they felt like, you know, it was, I didn't need it anymore, so that was right. probably, probably what, right, what they right. were thinking, I'm sure. But, uh, Dr. Breeding, in this society, people tend to, you know, respect medical doctors more than people who are psychologists, let's be honest, right? So they well, might... Part of, yeah, well, well yeah, it, well, it, it, it's, there's that, plus there's just the fact that the society is structured in a way in terms of that particular system that the medical people have the power. Now, my experience is that the very people that have the power can be weakened by their power. So that after you've gone through medical school and you have the ability to write prescriptions for expensive drugs and you're sort of looped into a very lucrative profession, 
not only yours, but the pharmacy, you know, behind you and in front of you and around you, so that if you don't exercise that option, you kind of feel like you wasted your time in medical school if you went straight for, you know, your PhD in psychology. So it seems you have to create some strategic alliances, like for a psychiatrist to come around and say, hey, Ritalin is just methamphetamine, that's a bigger deal than for a psychologist to, psychologist to say it, because they'll just say that the psychologist is uh, sour grapes, that, you know, he's saying it because he's not allowed to prescribe them. How do you deal with that? Well, there's not nearly enough, not nearly, there aren't near, nearly enough psychologists who uh, take a stand, but certainly there's more psychologists than there are psychiatrists, and you're right, you know. People have a hard time uh, going against their own training, vested interests and conditioning and training. Right. And, you know, there's a handful of dissident psychiatrists around the country and some really great ones, but they're very, very small numbers because they're just thoroughly conditioned into this belief system. And it's hard to confront, you know, that you've been doing something that's really harmful. I mean, that, 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 that not only the, the overt abuses, you know, like having sex with your client or something like that, but, but the everyday practice that you're doing is actually a direct violation of the Hippocratic Oath. You know, that's, that's a hard thing to confront, you know, that, that's, a, that's, uh, a, that's a career shattering kind of thing. And, right. And it takes a lot of courage and, and determination to do that. Uh, some people do it, but not very many. Right, right. Wow. I mean, it's now. Are you saying in all cases the medicine is bad? Well, you know, again, you know, there, there's, there's, you know, things are medi things are, are called medicine just because the doctor prescribes it, you know. But like, you could say, you know, you could say, you know, I take my I take my glass of wine. That's my medicine every night, you know. Well, that's 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 really a metaphor, right? You know. Although they call it may it have some truth to it in the sense that that's how you're soothing yourself and you're calling that medicine. But what really makes it a, technically a medicine is that it comes with a doctor's prescription, right? Seal of you approval, know? yeah. But, but the reality is that, you know, like I said, if, if you take Ritalin from a doctor's prescription, that's your medicine. But if you buy a few extra pills from somebody else who has a prescription, you're not taking medicine, you're taking an illicit drug. Or if you sell it, or if you buy it from one of your college friends to stay up and study for your test all Did night, you know, that? You know it, okay. that's not taking medicine, is it? You know? Wow. My point is that the drug, you know, Yeah. I just, I just like to call a spade a spade, you know? And right. So, you know, it's like, if, if you're not sick, can you really call it taking medicine? You know, and what I'm saying is that these so-called mental illnesses are not illnesses, you know. And so it's like if you want to, my view, I'm kind of a libertarian, you know, in terms of drugs. I believe in, you know, that in decriminalizing all drugs right. for adults, you know, that, that we should not be filling our prisons up with people's choices about using drugs. I think that adults, if the adult wants to, to drink, if they want to smoke pot, if they want to take Prozac, you know, that's up to them. I wouldn't right. necessarily recommend it, but I also wouldn't call it medicine. I would call it a drug that alters your mood and consciousness, and if you like that effect and want to take responsibility for it, that's your choice. It's, you know. a, it's a tough one to do. You know, I'm a real fighter, but I have to admit, when I'm in a doctor's office, you know, you just are sort of, you know, involved in the, in the aura of, of, like you say, authority. And you think, who am I? I haven't studied all these things and you just defer to it. Like, like the paper that I was reading about this uh, zero-point energy possibility that we've had a patent since 1871 that could take energy out of the vacuum is absolutely astonishing, and yet it never gets peer-reviewed. I'm sure it's not the only device. And, and I can also see how this label of mental illness can be slapped on people uh, maliciously for political reasons. And, that, and it sets back our entire society. But again, this, this scientist is also discovered, and he went through the same learning curve that you're talking about, this disillusionment phase, 
that ever since Albert Einstein and quantum mechanics, which apparently does not predict the behavior of matter as accurately as an ether-based paradigm, well, this is enormous. So I was attracted to your work, you know, on YouTube, because I'm seeing there's just this explosion coming from all these fields that maybe the institutions and the paradigms that we've invested so much faith in are not deserving of our faith. Well said. Well said. You know, it, uh, it, 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 it's hard. You know, it's hard to be disillusioned, but, but it's really worth it worthy because, one, you get to be, have a better relationship with reality. Exactly. <laughs> and two, exactly. you can protect yourself and, and those you love, you know. Right. It's like anyone who really knows, you know, the truth about uh, these things like so-called ADHD and that, you know, that, that, that it's basically a... A, uh, a scam, you know, that's a hundred, that's a fraud, you know, that, that, that the forces like behind it is, 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 is one of the most cynical corporate. What, it, what are you the, talking about? John, what are you talking about? AD, what, what does it mean? ADHD, attention deficit, so called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Really? That's the most wow. popular diagnosis. That's Did what you know Scott that? was talking about. That's the most popular uh, psychiatric diagnosis for kids. We've got millions of kids in our country that are taking heavy duty drugs because they supposedly have this illness and it's and the reality is it's a, it's a total fraud you know How and, long have you and known it's this? driven by the pharmaceutical yeah. industry Answer. and uh, they reap massive profits from it you know and so your your child becomes a product point you know and you get a child at age 6 or 7 like Scott you know Scott's fortunate in that he he, he didn't progress to a si Typically, what'll happen is you'll start on Ritalin, and then you'll, and then since it's addictive and there's tolerance, it happens. Then you end up in a higher dose, and then they switch you to a different drug. And then by the time you're a teenager, you're on three or four drugs, and you're a lifelong uh, profit point. Profit point. Okay. For uh, for the pharmaceutical industry and its wow. ancillary groups, and and uh, Scott's fortunate in that he managed to extricate himself from that, but all too many. Kids don't. It, it's 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 just it's just a tragic, tragic thing. Of course. Um, we're going to run a little over time. Is that okay? Maybe Gloria might, or you want to wrap well, it up? Yes, Gloria. What time you want to go to? Five. Whatever, Gloria. Do you have anything you want to say? Share your experience. I'll I'll. What can be done about that? Uh, the nursing homes can stop being uh, stop being private. They should be not for profit, and they should employ people to take care of the patients in the nursing homes, so that they don't have to drug them to stop them from walking around. <gasps> oh my God! So what you're saying is, for the sake of making a profit on the medicine, and for the sake of making seniors easier to manage, we're Correct. giving them medicine. Yes. Um, wow. There, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal. There tons of articles around. If you walk into a nursing home in, in New York City today, you'll see all of these people sitting around all doped up. Nine out of ten of them don't need drugs. Now, nine out of ten of them surely must have family come to visit them and be horrified. Well, first of all, the family doesn't realize. They think they're sick. Oh. Because they're told that they're sick. Oh, my gosh. Dr. Breeding, can you say anything about that? Do you have any experience with over-medicating seniors? Well, sure, yeah. Gloria's exactly right. You know, I've worked, I've spent quite a bit of time in nursing homes, and it's, it's just another, it's another huge scandal. You know, the psychiatry tends to pick on vulnerable groups, you know, and the kids and, and, and the elders. And, you know, you've got, nowadays, you've got over half of the elders in, in nursing homes that are on heavy-duty psychiatric drugs, and Gloria's exactly right. It, it, it's to basically to, to manage the situation with with understaffing and large numbers of elders in these institutions. And so, you know, if the elder is is uh, is is is, is kind of anxious or irritable, you know, then they give them some kind of heavy-duty tranquilizer or knock them out. And on the other hand, if they're sad and depressed, and they give them a speed to, you know, and then just jerk them around and and a lot of them, you know, it just makes them easier, it's apparently, or they easier to manage, and uh, they can just sleep and be kind of zombified, and 
it's 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 Excuse terrible me, and, 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 on, and on top wow. of that they, they already have weakened organ systems and so it's just killing them that much quicker did you know that the, the, oh the just a second john i think gloria wants to say something there's Go one other problem a lot of times these people are not sick or older they can walk around but they're afraid that they might fall and that they will be sued so they prefer to keep them in bed so that they don't get sued and or, this is an addition oh my god because if somebody is able to walk and they're not able to walk um uh very well or they walk slowly they don't want to be bothered with them they'd rather see them in bed wow and yep. this is a big problem because you have all the baby boomers starting to retire and they're going to go into all of these nursing homes and what will there aren't enough nursing homes number one and second of all if they're going to drug them to keep them from moving around they also get bed sores then and you also see a lot of them with their uh something happens to their legs and it's probably because they're not walking around they should be getting exercise and walking around. Wow. That's right. Well, anyway. You're, you're in New York, right? Yes, you're calling and in New to York Manhattan. is also the center, one of the main centers in the country of electroshock. And, 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 and it's the elders who get, percentage-wise, who get electroshocked more than anybody. And, uh, and that's happening in New York a lot, as well as forced electroshock, which is I thought that happening all the time years. to where people are getting dozens and uh, sometimes literally hundreds of court-ordered electroshocks in your institution. Just a huge scandal in the Office of Mental Health up there in New York right now. That's amazing. I thought that they, that they ditched le electroshock a long time ago is a very primitive method of dealing with that. Uh, well, that's With still the, the most common reaction of the general public. It's, you mean they're still doing that? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, uh, like I said, over 100,000 people a year in the United States. And, and New York is really the epicenter. You know, you've got Columbia University and these other places there that, that have these eminent wow. medical doctors in the psychiatry departments who really are push and promote electroshock. And you have the institutions there in New York that, uh, that, that electroshock a lot of people, and it tends to be the elderly people, particularly elderly women, who get the brunt of it. Wow. Um, well, I'm astonished. Um, I really want to thank you for calling in and telling you that for me, whenever I face these grisly topics, um, it's always initially disheartening. But the heartening thing is, is that there are more elegant solutions to our problems. And I find, right. I find that people like you, you know, doing the work that you're doing, posting your work on YouTube, and, you know, Scott is doing a documentary called Dying for Change. Uh, you know, we can get the word out and create a better society. Very good. Anything you want to say, Scott, in closing? I just appreciate, you know, someone like him, like you said, putting videos up on YouTube. Um, and do you do lectures as well uh, or anything? Do you go to universities? I was just curious about yeah, that. Well, my, my website is wildestcults.com. That's one of my books is The Wildest Cults Make the Best Horses. So it's W-I-L-D-E-S-T-C-O-L-T-S, wildestcults.com. And, uh, and then our electroshock website is endofshock.com. But yeah, I, I, I do, I'm available for talks and yeah. stuff. I'm based here in Austin, but uh, I've got a number of YouTube videos up. You can just YouTube and then, then uh, search for John Breeding and you can find my rants and comments on various topics. Great. Well, <laughs> what, what I'll do is I'll post this on YouTube as well as show it on Manhattan Neighborhood Network and then we'll link it. And let's see if we can get a panel in because I think George Steinfeld, Alan's uh, uncle, has a lot of experience and some interesting thoughts. And now that you've called it to my attention that New York is one of the hot spots for electroshock, you know me, I'm on it. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, my name is Paula Gloria, and this has been an episode of Farther Down the Rabbit Hole. We've been joined by Dr. John Breeding from Austin, Texas. Thank you, John, for joining us. Thank you. And Scott Goldberg, who's the producer of Dying for Change. Thanks, Scott. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching.